Welcome to our, our first panel of the day, and uh, may I say one of the most interesting ones, although I might be biased. Um, so just to sum up what uh, Ben already talked about, what sort of what we have here, what we have right now, is definitely the change in the trends in uh, of the consumer behavior of how people sort of consume their entertainment. We see um, the great success of uh, some of the online video services, which is obviously uh, is based on the foundation of you know having this instantaneous and ubiquitous access to content. On the other hand, we also have this. Um, well, in some countries, we see um, the phenomena of court cutting, of court uh, shaving, of court, you know, people who are now named as court, court nevers. Um, so, sort of, we see that 2014 really brought us this, um, the whole, it was really a year of this great unbundling, where pay TV operators really moved into this OTT, um, in the OTT world, uh, while some of the biggest OTT operators are now making their way into the pay TV ecosystems in the same time. And sort of on top of all of that, we of course have an audience in its full diversity. We have boomers, we have Generation X, we have millennials, and I think I'm done with all the buzzwords for today. So let me introduce my panel. Um, so today we're joined by um, Adam Nightingale, VP of Sales of Acido who is the company famous for enabling the uh, smart TV and IPTV applications. Um, next to him, we have Mihai Krasniano, uh, CEO of Gradius Lab, content aggregating company, uh, again, for multi-screen TV and for VOD solutions uh, and services. Uh, we also have John Gisby, um, the EVP <coughs> business development of Magin. Um, the, um, uh, online TV platform, who is now uh, available in Germany and in Sweden. Um, <coughs> next, we have uh, Ricardo Rubio Gonzalez, head of New Media Research and 71 Media and Brazilian Sat Eins, uh, obviously TV ad uh, advertising sales agency operating in GSA region, um, selling obviously the full Brazilian Sat Eins portfolio. And uh, Daniel Winner, uh, who's most recently been um, dealing with mobile initiatives in Amazon, and before that, um, helping Vodafone and BSKB be where they are now. And of course, my co-moderator, Ben Keen, who I'm sure all of you know. So John, let's, let's pick on you first. So <laughs> now you're mic'd up, ready to go. So you, you've, you've had, um, <coughs> to the extent that anyone can have a long career in digital media, you've had a long career in digital media, some pretty famous <coughs> companies. You, you've now joined Magine, which is, um, you know, maybe not so famous. What attracted you? What's, 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 uh, what's interesting about the Magine project that, um, that, that brings you on board? For anybody over a certain age here, um, we all remember the PowerPoint. Uh, we've seen it many, many, uh, probably for uh, at least a decade or two that says, at some point, there will be a world in which linear and catch-up and TV and premium video and other sorts of video uh, can be available on any device, on any network, with a variety of different business models, and won't that be fantastic? Because actually, as a consumer experience, uh, that's probably the consumer experience we'd all like. And all of that PowerPoint that we all saw for the last 10 or 20 years all stopped with that's all very well, but the technology doesn't allow it yet. Uh, and one day it will. And when it does, we will realize that actually broadcasting and some of the delivery mechanisms and the business models in the industry that's grown up around technological constraints doesn't actually make sense from a consumer point of view, and at that point, the world will change. Uh, digital switchover turned out not to be the big deal. Um, and actually, the way that we all consume content and channels hasn't actually changed that much still vast majority linear, as, as we've been hearing, still uh, PVL has changed a bit. Uh, two or three things have happened over the course of the last literally handful of years at scale. The cloud is one, as we heard from Nick earlier. Smart devices, I think, are pretty key. Uh, however exciting a new set-top box is, um, we all carry set-top boxes in our pockets all the time. Uh, a lot of these have more processing power than most set-top boxes or a better experience than many set-top boxes can ever be. Um, and and 
coming slowly ubiquitous broadband in terms of IP, fixed and mobile. Uh, that enables all sorts of new consumer services, it enables all sorts of new distribution models, new business models, it enables big data, it enables new advertising models, and suddenly all of that mix uh, comes, into, uh, comes into play. It's also um, an, an intensely competitive environment with lots of new services launching, and Ricardo in, in Germany um, you know, we're seeing a lot of competition in the marketplace already. Uh, you've, for instance, got a partnership, I believe, with Machine in Germany of some kind. Yeah. Uh, but there's all sorts of other players in the German market. <coughs> how do we make sense of, uh, of that competitive dynamic? And how do, how do you, as a company, you know, have some um, differentiating proposition? Um. Well, for, first of all, we, we heard a lot about how consumer, uh, consumers are changing the ways they, they watch TV. And let, let me just give you some numbers to put this into perspective and then, and then go on and talk about the, the partnerships we do with OTT providers. Uh, so we started researching this change in, in, in the shift in consumer behavior a couple of years ago when we saw the uh, PVRs uh, coming into markets. And we had by then, like 10 years ago, we were uh, forecasting PVR penetration around 30% in, in a time frame of five to 10 years, which was massively, was huge. And everybody was, obviously everybody in, in the broadcasting business was very nervous about that. So then we, we, um, we had like 2% of the, the whole TV viewing was time shifted. So now 15 years later, when we do the exact, when we compare the exact the same numbers, we are still seeing that 2% of the overall TV viewing time is still time shifted. So we talked about laziness of the TV viewership. That's definitely there, and that's not going to have, an, have a change in the next two to three or even probably five years. So what we are seeing is, especially in the younger um, um, age groups, there, well, there, there was already a shift that it, uh, traditionally these are um, age groups that watch less TV. They consume lots of other things. They play games. Um, so these people start start um, watching TV over non um, non traditional um, ways like OTT services, like uh, let's say uh, a stick and antenna connected to the laptop. So and this is increasing. That's the reason because we want those people to start. You know, to start engaging with the with the linear TV, and that's why we are offering all of our um, content throughout the OTT services. Um, we still don't see this um, huge change in the younger groups reflected in the older groups. So when we go beyond the 30 plus age group, we still see 80, 98 percent, 98 percent of the TV viewing time um, linear. At the same time, we see that the um, on top of that, the uh, digital video consumption is really, really low, around probably 3 to 4%, the maximum. So if it's only 3 to 4%, why bother? <laughs> well, uh, because, um, I mean, what we are seeing is that, that uh, what's happening here is that, um, let's say, places where traditional TV was not watched, right? Mm. Um, that's why we're seeing an increase in, in consumption, like when you are on the tube, when you're commuting, uh, when you're away from home. And that's, that's you know, definitely where we want to reach the the, the audience um, being with uh, you know the live broadcast or the, the catch-up services um, and that's um, you know because we are talking about what's going to happen with broadcast so my concern would rather be what's going to happen if I would work in a newspaper or magazine because that's where we're seeing the shift more from traditional media like newspapers and magazines to, to online video services mm -hmm. and we don't see that so much in, in, in the homes and just to give you another number if we um, if we um, aggregate the whole um, video consumption at homes, 98 again, 98 percent is still watched on the on the television sets. Um, we are seeing an increase in, especially in paid video services now from last year to this year, in in smartphones, which means, which is a good sign, which means that people are, uh, when they are away from home, they are consuming. Um, video content and they are willing to pay for it, something we didn't see a year or two years ago. So there's definitely a shift. Um, and and that, that's the reason why, you know, as a broadcaster, we need to kind of, you know, when we see that change in behavior, we need to be there with our content. And that's why we partner with Matching and other OTT services.
Mm. Mihai, you, you work with um, partners in some pretty far-flung countries around the world. What differences in, in behavior are you seeing in some of those markets? Tell us about some of the, the, the differences that you see. Um, <clears throat> to, first of all, to, to give some perspective, um, what our job, our mission in life is to help uh, operators, telcos and, and pay TV operators essentially, to build their own Netflix and iTunes service around the world. Uh, that's probably the most ambitious task ever. Uh, obviously, it's just a dreamland to, to reach that level. Uh, however, these, these operators need to compete because they just have the pressure of these uh, massive companies coming and eating into their uh, business, and they just can't stand there and, and, uh, and not <laughs> reacting. Um, so it's very interesting to see um, that, f first of all, before even speaking about differences, how, uh, how uh, comparable uh, the content is, con is consumed across the world. We, we work in, in Europe, in, in Latin America, in Middle East, in Southeast Asia, and uh, I would say the, the Hollywood content is, is definitely what, what, what's consumed. Uh, uh, that's the driver. That's that 70, 80 percent of people, what people consume and expect. Uh, but as usual, and as usual in any uh, content landscape, uh, the local content is key. And, and if you don't provide local content, then you have a big gap. Uh, it doesn't work the other way around. Uh, essentially, if you if you if you provide local content, no matter how rich it is, it will never really fly. Uh, it will ne never really catch up. But uh, without that, you, you always have a, 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 an issue. Um, and uh, so much so than, that um, uh, even Netflix, when they go to Latin America or now to Asia, uh, they are getting local content. That's, that's the first thing they do. Uh, the difficulty is to, to see and to imagine what kind of <coughs> programming, what kind of catalogs, what kind of content offering each operator needs to build in its own country. And the reality is that uh, there are so many reports in any country about media consumption and profiling and what demographics consume which content. But these things are extremely biased. Why? Because what people consume is what they have. Right? They turn the TV on, they watch whatever uh, this TV is, is spitting to them. And this is made by, uh, you know, it's, it's a decision made by a group of people. Uh, UK is probably 10 people, 20 people making this decision. And every group has that. It's those guys who are going to Los Angeles next week and the following week to get the screenings and watch the pilots and decide whatever they're going to buy and then decide some things that they want to produce and invest on. And that defines, essentially, the consumption in, in each country. Uh, is that exactly what people want to watch? Well, uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, because you're launching a new service, you, you, you can start from fresh. And one of the things we, we do, and, and actually one of the things that Netflix does when they go in a new market, they obviously look at those numbers. They're absolutely uh, important but they look especially at what is the content that is most pirated in this, mm -hmm. in this country. So they analyze the last three years of uh, illegal streams, of uh, illegal peer-to-peer -peer downloading, because that's going to tell you more precisely what really interests people, because that's, it's a decision, and not an easy decision. It requires some effort, some time. Uh, so the blend of two gives you a good idea of how to program your content. And it's surprising to see that sometimes local content doesn't really uh, uh, pay off. Other times is the local content that is key. And it depends on, on, on the countries and the years and, and, uh, and obviously the moments. Sometimes local content is stronger than other times. Well, content is definitely a big subject which I would like to we return to a bit later. But for now, Adam, can I ask you to defend those people who are having this amazing piece of technology in their living room and only watching a linear television? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if they, uh, if they need defending, but I was talking to a colleague 
uh, a few weeks ago, and he he, he made an absolutely thank you. And he made an absolutely abundantly obvious point. He said the killer app for mm. TV is still TV. There's an awful lot you can do with connected TVs. Mm. You can build in social integration. You can build in all kinds of clever things, but. Fundamentally, you buy a big screen for your living room to watch great content on it. Yep. I think the, um, where, where, the, where it starts to get interesting is where we have this increasing fragmentation across the market. We've got fragmentation on the devices where mm -hmm. we can watch content. We've got fragmentation mm -hmm. in where content rights are available. Maybe I can watch it only on an iPad in yep. some country. Maybe I can watch it on a connected TV in another. So I think... The amount of content we have access to, the number of devices we can access it on, and the times and places and ways we can watch it uh, are also becoming increasingly complicated. So from a user point of view, I think the difficulty we have is yeah. in making it easy for people to find what they want to watch. I was interested yeah. in, in the UView search capability and how, yeah. you can, how you can help lead people to great content. But fundamentally, if I've got a connected TV and I go to the App Store on that, I've got Netflix, I've got ITV, I've got BBC, I've got Channel 4, I've, I've got a whole raft of different places where I can find something. Yeah. And we had a, yeah, clearly it's all fun and games in my house, but we all must have spent about 20 minutes one weekend evening a few weeks ago with one of us looking through the Sky EPG on an iPad, one of my sons looking at what's on Amazon, another one's looking at what's on Netflix, my wife's looking somewhere else. We weren't watching telly at all. We were just looking for something. Mm. Eventually we found something and it was terrible, so we turned it off and gave up. But it, was, <laughs> it was a deeply disappointing experience, right. fundamentally. So I, I go to Netflix and it's great at recommending stuff for me. It's really good. The recommendation capability mm -hmm. in Netflix is terrific. So you didn't know what you were looking for. That but, was and the that, you know what? Isn't that the problem? Because you know, maybe a comedy or maybe a drama or my eldest son, you know, everything's mm. fast and furious. And, yeah. you know, he's, 25% of the decision making, so he lost. But maybe we should have gone with what he wanted. I don't know, if, at least it would have been uh, amusing. But you're right, it, it's knowing what you want and then finding mm. it. So I, I think the, uh, the big, big issue that the industry has at the moment is in making content easily accessible to people where there are so many different places to find it. Now, some of the connected TV manufacturers are starting to get closer. But when content providers, content aggregators are, are bold enough to provide access, and um, I've forgotten the name of the thing, there was a terrific app that did this, but when you can get easy access to all the metadata, all the rights information, all the price information for all the content available on the device that you're looking at, and then decide where you want to buy content from or, or however you want to do it, then I think we're in a, in a situation where us as consumers and, and everyone else in the market who consumes content will have a, a more enjoyable TV viewing experience and frankly a less frustrating Saturday night with a takeaway yeah. in front of a, an empty TV screen. Right. Daniel, do, do you expect any, the emergence of any, <laughs> any new yeah. content categories that uh, are specifically <laughs> focused on connected devices? <clears throat> Um, so first of all, let me give you a sense of the kind of lens or perspective I, I have on this, uh, this space. Um, I've, I've recently uh, been running a, a storefront, the Amazon App Store, distributing apps, games, and video services across multiple devices. And prior to that, um, helping to develop and build out Love Films digital streaming offer. I mean, I, I, my view of this space is, uh, first of all, you know, if you're in the business of originating and commercializing content, you've never had it so good. The market's getting bigger uh, and there's more money to be made. Beneath all that, I'm, I, I think we're seeing a market that's polarizing. You're sounding uh, like a politician, you know. You've never <laughs> had it so good. Well, you know. It's, it's, uh, Studios, you've never had it so good. Th there, there is more money to be made. And I think the question is uh, if you're able to generate more cash, what do you do with it? But let me just come on to kind of a, a related point, and I'll answer your question directly in a second. I'm, I think we're seeing the market polarize. So if you have highly valued content that distribution, distribution platforms really want, you're in an unbelievable position. You can uh, extract more value from those uh, relationships, um, and 
you have the opportunity to, you know, if you've got really strong franchises, to go direct to customer. Uh, and you know, there were really exciting growth opportunities there. Uh, and I think the question for those folks is, if you've got all that extra cash, what do you do with it? And in my view, that there is a great innovation opportunity for those people who've, who've got that capability to, to generate more cash. Uh, what is the innovation opportunity? Well, I think the innovation opportunity is potentially around niches. So you know, we've been in a world where uh, customers have been served by uh, pay and multi-channel TV. Uh, and you know, the economics of pay and multi-channel TV have been such that it's only been worthwhile serving audiences that have a certain sort of size. But now we're in a different world, and niches are now economically viable. Uh, we've seen that in the app space. We've seen you know, services like Headspace, which offers meditation for people who are into that kind of stuff, make very good money serving niches that have a very strong need for certain types of content. And I think we're going to see a lot more of those niches being served um, through uh, these connected devices, through over-the-top services. And let me give you an example. There's uh, uh, a service that... Uh, it's distributed on the Amazon Fire TV called Quello Concerts. It's access to um, uh, music concerts um, for music fans. You pay a subscription, it does very well. Those niches, I think, are, uh, are going to be one of the big, exciting new business opportunities. So in terms of that market polarisation, I think you're going to see the people at the top of the tree who've got that great must-have content doing really well. You're going to see people who can serve those niches build new businesses around that. But if you're not in those two groups, I think you're going to be squeezed. You're going to be in the squeeze middle, and you're going to have to really potentially rethink your business. Sounds like long tail theory. <coughs> there's, there's certainly a bit of that. I think, I think the long tail will start to become interesting in this new world of over-the-top services. Ricardo, do you, do you agree? Do you think there's an opportunity in, in, in more niche, more specialist content, yeah. more niche channels? Yeah, yeah, I, w I would agree on that. And, and we internally we've been discussing the, the long tail a lot. I mean, the long tail is around for many, many years. YouTube doing quite well on it. So the, the question is how, how can, as a broadcaster, as a content provider, how can we monetize that long tail? And I, I agree the, um, it would be in the niche. Um, the the other question is so how, how to identify those niches who are big enough at the end to be viable. I mean they need to be scalable on an international way. I think that's where where probably as a as a local or or you know in your country as a provider um, would be a good starting point. Um, so start looking for niches that you know are probably around where you have like a a, um, a, ba um, a fan base in in your market and the content is just not available there. I mean there's a lot around Asia content that's just not in the reach of the, the, um, the viewership in, in Europe yet, so people try alternative ways to get to the content. So making, making this content available for, for those people. Um, the, um, the other point um, would then be, um, you know, how to, what, what's the, um, um, how, how much are people um, uh, willing to pay for that kind of content, you know, and, and you can, we, we saw niches where, where willingness to pay is, is rather high, you know, compared to all the, 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 the general content you have in the market, you know, like if you would ask people, uh, you know, would you pay 10 pounds, 10 euros for like a subscription service, probably, you know, like one out of 10 would say yes. If you start with the niches, you can go even higher, you know, there's, there's like there are some niches where you know, you, you can go exponentially high compared to that. Um, so yes, the niche, the question for us as a broadcaster is how to, how to bring those niches, you know, make them fit to, the, to your broad content. Um, OTT services is, a, is an answer for that. You know, it'd be a good choice to, to start experimenting with um, OTT services, you know, package those niches and bring it to, to the consumer. John, can you scale a business on niches? Um, you can, because I think the economics of, of serving these niches are different. Sorry. <laughs> there, we, there we go. Yes? Hooray. Um, but I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle on this. 
um, because if you, I, th I think it will take a long time to change. So I think that the, 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 the basic point around laziness of viewers, the residual viewing on linear, um, the behavior, the, the installed base of TVs, and the, the, you know, we're, we're trying to change decades of, of consumer behavior. Um, and I think that will take time. Um, and I think niches is, is, is a, there's, there's a danger of thinking about niches in the way that we think about niches in, in the sort of classic internet sense that there are hundreds of millions of channels on YouTube and each of them has three viewers. Um, I actually think we're talking about basic marketing, which, which in a way the industry has, has never had some of the tools to be able to do before, which is that actually we can begin to segment an audience and, and differentiate the service and the pricing and the content they get in, a, in I was going to say, in a much more sophisticated way, just in a, in, a, in a relatively sophisticated way, relative to the way the industry's been able to do it before, precisely because, as we've all said, it's, it's been around the economics of putting up satellites and digging up roads and, and putting in installed bases of set-top boxes. Um, and I think the economics change, which means that you can, I, th I think we're on a journey, very early stages of a journey, where we can start to price up different packages. And I think those niches can be quite substantial. Um, I think there are niches of, of consumers, I'm one of them, who at the moment has to take a big big chunk of channels on uh, to, to get a few channels that I actually want. That world will, will change, but I think it will take time. Um, but I do think the economics allow you, allow you to start doing it. I, th I, I also think that there's, there's another key point which, which um, I'll, I'll kind of uh, I'll, I'll wrap a couple of pieces of data around a quote, um, a very interesting quote from a, a, a digital content producer who just said, in a way, the TV industry has been kidding itself, thinking that people watch four hours of television a day. Because another way of looking at it is they're watching four hours of video on a screen. Yeah. And if you think of it like that, then actually, what other sources of video are there? What other services are possible alongside that? And how do those two worlds coexist? Um, completely get the point about big sets and the, the, the kind of communal viewing experience and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, interesting stat that um, uh, Benedict Evans uh, came out with, which is that over the course of the last few years, TV sets, TV sets are now um, around 25% of the installed base of video receiving devices. Um, a, a, a world that's come from nowhere, that actually almost all of us are carrying a video receiving device with us all the time. Uh, and I don't know if there's anybody from Uyala in the room, but one of their latest uh, video indexes, um, almost 50% of the time spent viewing video content on a tablet is content that's at least 30 minutes long. So we are, we're heading into a new world. We're heading into a world where each of those devices, the viewer is generally individually authenticated, so you know exactly who it is and what they're watching and what, they're, what, what the, you're able to collect data from them, which means, like retailers did 20 years ago, you can start to think through different groups of, of, of individual viewers and what services might become possible. And the technology now allows it. But as I say, I think we're in, <coughs> we're in very early days of, of kind of walking through a mountain range that's been there for a very, very long time. So I think it'll take a while to figure out. Irina. Um, hi, I just want... Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to ask you about sort of the international points of view, yes, because we, I have a feeling we all sort of really developed world-centric, and would you, would, you, would you have to sort of add to it from your Middle East, Southeast Asia point of view on the, on the content, on the niche content, and of course tie it to what devices it's on there? Well, again, um, okay. yeah. I don't know, maybe even mine works, no, this one, yeah. Um, I want to please first our friends from the studios here and the content owners with whom we work yeah. uh, and tell them that actually their content works well in every country. Again, that's, that's a fact. Yeah. Uh, and investing in, in, uh, in massive productions uh, pays off. Uh, everybody wants them. Um, now, uh, it's true that uh, when, when we live in, in, you know, in Western Europe or, or the US, we tend to be a bit blind on what's happening on the ground uh, in the evolving markets. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, I see that absolutely every day that uh, the main screen for probably at least a billion people is the smartphone. Uh, a Chinese smartphone which in terms of quality is very comparable to an iPhone, 
uh, with a very solid Android base, uh, it's less than $100, okay, maybe 80 in some markets. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a slightly bigger than an iPhone 6, uh, so it kind of starts to be a bit of a phablet mm -hmm. uh, and has embedded hardware capabilities to deliver video uh, stunningly well. Uh, so there we are, we have the audience. Uh, and this audience can consume whatever they want all the time. Uh, and the good thing is that piracy is not so easy to get there because how mm. do you fit a pirate DVD in that device? That's hard. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, w when it comes to content, I w my, my observation is that uh, content cross-pollinizes very well across the regions. It's stunning to see how Latin American telenovelas are doing well in Philippines and Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Very popular. How the Turkish content picked up in the Middle East. It's one of the most premium content right now in the Middle East, and it's all made in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, with Turkish actors. Uh, how Korean dramas uh, are doing well literally around the world. And what yeah. Koreans did is just copy literally the, the pop Japanese culture, yeah. or the J-pop is mm -hmm. coming from there. Uh, but they did it in a much more commercial way, much yeah. more marketing way. Uh, and, uh, and then, because of uh, the US and maybe probably Europe showing the way in terms of quality of production, yeah. uh, and cost of production now being much lower than a couple of years ago, you can see local productions having uh, production values which are very high. So suddenly you have people in Malaysia, like, like Astro, or, or people in Indonesia, or, or in Korea, yeah. producing stunning TV series that actually can very well sell in other yep. parts of the world with the same quality standards as you know the, the comic from the backyards of, of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting enough, we all realize at that scale that we're humans and actually we, we all vibrate on the same more or less frequencies with more or less same values. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it works more or less the same, uh, even, even in complicated countries like, like China or India, where yeah. you can say, well, there's a very strong local culture. But even there, even there, all these things work, of course, together with the local content. But international and, and the blend is something which is really happening. Okay, I want to open it up for questions in a second. So, so get your questions ready, get your hands ready. Um, Daniel. We talked a lot about content, the importance of content. Is it ever the case that features, functions, user experience, or indeed price, trump content in the marketplace? OK, well, let me, let me answer that question indirectly rather than directly. Um, so I have the same question. Right. So, <coughs> You're in a world now where we've got an increasing range of devices. We've, we've heard about the, the user trends. We're seeing, in particular, mobile devices uh, accounting for a, a really meaningful chunk of uh, a, a viewing of uh, on-demand and OTT content. Now, I think what's, what's interesting is if you think about the, the feature set of mobile devices, smartphones and tablets, uh, you do have the opportunity to, uh, to craft new content experiences that take advantage of those features, whether it's you know, location, whether it's screen size, whether it's some of the other features that are uh, in those devices. And you've seen players in the apps and games market take advantage of those feature sets to create exciting, innovative content. Uh, you know, my, my observation is if you're in the video industry, there's been you know, not so much of that innovation happening. You, what you've seen is uh, people distributing stuff that's been created for the big screen on mobile devices with very little adaptation. So I think the, the opportunity for the future is to think about uh, content, craft it in a way that's sensitive to that device context, and take advantage of some of the feature sets that are available uh, and do some innovative stuff. And you know, if, you're, if you're in that position where you're, you're doing well, you're in that top tier, 
that's the opportunity going forward. Uh, in terms of kind of pricing, packaging, and promotion, um, again, I, I kind of look look to some of the innovation that's going on in the the apps and games market and see to what extent is that applicable to you in the uh, in the business of um, you know, uh, commercialising video content. That there are all sorts of interesting models that are potentially uh, applicable from um, you know, the freemium and in-app purchases, uh, uh, dynamic pricing, all those things you know, could potentially be applied in, in a video context. But also, you know, if, you, if you think about this new world, and I think um, we had a really interesting slide in one of the earlier presentations where you saw a supermarket with tons of stuff, uh, and you know, John's made the point about you know, we all need to get a bit cuter in terms of the way that we promote our content and package our content in that environment. You know, the, the storefronts, you know, the, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, they're hungry for content providers to package promotions, whether that's price promotions or other types of promotions, so that they can offer something more attractive to their customers. So you know, if, if you can build the skills to do that kind of, uh, that kind of work, then you're going to be in a, a strong position, I believe. Adam, do you agree? Yeah, I, I, I do to an extent. I, I think we've had for years this debate about you know, is content king or is it God or is something else king? And, and I, I guess we're still trying to work it out. But I, I think very much that content absolutely is king. If you have great content, then you can defend high prices. Look at Sky with, uh, with the amount of money it spends on sports and the way it can use sport as a for the most part, still a very strong differentiator to defend very high monthly fees and absolutely worth it if you're, if you're buying into sports. Um, but you have as well to build features, you have to build functionality and you have to build the user experience beyond only the content to make it truly entertaining, to make it interesting for people to engage, not just with that content, but with Sky or whoever it is as a brand and as a service provider. So we, as a, as, as a, yeah, from, from the Exedo perspective, are seeing a lot of increase in demand for things like companion apps, for apps which make it easy to, to find content to consume it anywhere. We're seeing an increased demand for content that can be downloaded onto an iPad or a phone and, and carried around with you. So around this, this essential hub of fantastic content, there's very much a need to build a very feature-rich, very engaging, very compelling consumer proposition. Because if content lets you have a high price in the first place, an engaging service wrapped around that helps you defend that price and helps to reduce the churn that yeah, we might otherwise start to see more of in the market. Questions, Thank comments? Any hands? Yeah. At the back there. At the back, isn't it? Yes, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so um, this may be a long question and I'll, I'll break it down, but um, I live in Finland, so um, very different from the very saturated market we've got here in the UK. So we have all the global players um, providing set-top boxes, Netflix, and content is king, but there's a strong need for local content. Um, there's um, the option to pay for multiple services. Um, I, li I live in a house where we I've got a set-top box, I've got a card in one TV, I've got another digital card in another TV, four iPads, Sonos systems, and multiple phones. Two kids, and we still haven't found the balance. And I found that I, I love these services, I love the content, but then I'm actually stopping the subscriptions. So um, I think Finland, rather like many other non-English speaking um, countries um, are going to be in a, a state where global players try to make a standpoint there and deliver great content, but because they don't actually provide great global content at the right time or indeed local content, they're going to have trouble. And I just wondered through your experience, have you come across this? And then what sort of industry plans are there to, to ensure that non-speaking countries get served with good content, correctly priced, and um, at the right time. Who wants to take that? 
Need any classification? It was a long question. I, I think it's a common problem. I, I don't know if there's an <coughs> obvious answer. I'll talk for a bit in case someone's got one, but that kind of fragmentation <laughs> is typical. It's particularly typical in Scandinavia as well. And I, we, we're headquartered in Stockholm and do a lot of business there. And if you look at some of the stats, it's increasingly the case that, you know, we, we talk about people cord cutting. I, I think actually they're growing across multiple vendors. They may trim one cord slightly, but then they're subscribing to whether it's an HBO or a Netflix as, as an adjunct to what they've already got to solve exactly the kind of problem that you describe. I, th I, think, I think most of the non-English uh, speaking countries have that problem. Uh, and the example of Finland shows that probably the market is not so saturated after all. Uh, you are saturated by global players. Uh, I don't know how much by local players. And certainly there's room for those local players to do something. And certainly with time, even the global players will have to open up to, to local content and to distribute local content. Having said that, uh, you still have the problem of uh, separated universes between each of those players who don't necessarily allow a meta aggregator or a meta engine uh, in a way browse across all of them and find whatever you want. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the stone here because I think it's, it's, it's the best example ever, but it's, it's a pirate product, popcorn time, right? So I know nobody heard about that and nobody installed it, but if one day you hear about it and you see it, you see, first of all, what a wonderful user experience, how fast, how easy, how sleek, how straightforward it is to use it. <coughs> Obviously, being pirated, you have literally everything you want, but everything you want is available also legally somewhere, somehow. Uh, the problem is nobody cracked this equation of putting all these people together, each one offering their own line of business, but suddenly someone could say, listen, uh, I, I want the Google of all that, and let me easily access uh, all this content that's so far in silos. I think it's a technology issue, probably a business model issue, uh, and certainly a market uh, maturation issue as well. So John, the pirates are out aggregating you. Uh, yeah, I mean, Mike, sorry. <clears throat> um, well, it, I mean, it, I'm still not sure if this is on. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it was it, it was ever thus uh, in terms of the pirates. I mean, I think with the the position that we start from is that uh, this all starts with live, uh, and and live is a mixture of uh, global and local content with, with a predominance for local. Um, so if you can provide an aggregated service of live on any device in a, in a seamless, beautiful way with, with a, a great user interface and, and great recommendations and search and all the, all the sorts of things you'd expect from these platforms, that becomes a way of, uh, of improving the core experience. Um, and I think on the back of that, we'll, th things will progress over time. I think, uh, I think you are probably at peak frustration right now. Um, uh, in the sense that, as I said, I think we're in early days. And I think, uh, I think ultimately, uh, now that the technology does enable this stuff to happen, over time the consumer will, is bound to win out. But I think it'll it'll take a, this is this is this is lots of different industries trying to adjust pretty big tectonic plates to, to figure this stuff out. And I think it'll take a while. Okay, that was a great discussion. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Very much. <laughs>